In theory, a computer could let meteorologists do what astronomers have been able to do with pencil and slide rule, reckon the future of their universe from its initial conditions and the physical laws that guide its evolution. The equations describing the motion of air and water were as well known as those describing the motion of planets. Astronomers did not achieve perfection and never would. Not in a solar system tugged by the gravities of nine planets, scores of moons and thousands of asteroids, but calculations of planetary motion were so accurate that people forgot that they were forecasts. When an astronomer said, Comet Haley will be back this way in 76 years, it seemed like fact, not prophecy. Deterministic numerical forecasting figured accurate courses for spacecraft and missiles. Why not winds and clouds? There was always one small compromise, so small that working scientists usually forgot it was there, lurking in a corner of their philosophies like an unpaid bill. Measurements could never be perfect. With his primitive computer, Lorentz had boiled weather down to the barest skeleton. Yet, line by line, the winds and temperatures in Lorentz's printouts seemed to behave in a recognizable earthly way. They matched his cherished intuition about the weather, his sense that it repeated itself, displaying familiar patterns over time, pressure rising and falling, the airstream swinging north and south, but the repetitions were never quite exact. There was pattern with disturbances, an orderly disorder. To make the patterns plain to see, Lorentz created a primitive kind of graphics. Instead of just printing out the usual lines of digits, he would have the machine print a certain number of blank spaces, followed by the letter A. He would pick one variable, perhaps the direction of the airstream. Gradually, the A's marched down the roll of paper, swinging back and forth in a wavy line, making a long series of hills and valleys that represented the way the west wind would swing north and south across the continent. The orderliness of it, the recognizable cycles coming around again and again, but never twice the same way, had a hypnotic fascination. The system seemed slowly to be revealing its secrets to the forecaster's eye. One day in the winter of 1961, wanting to examine one sequence at greater length, Lorenz took a shortcut. Instead of starting the whole run over, he started midway through. To give the machine its initial conditions, he typed the numbers straight from the earlier printout. Then he walked down the hall to get away from the noise and drink a cup of coffee. When he returned an hour later, he saw something unexpected, something that planted a seed for a new science. This new run should have exactly duplicated the old. Lorenz had copied the numbers into the machine himself. The program had not changed. Yet, as he stared at the new printout, Lorenz saw his weather diverging so rapidly from the pattern of the last run that within just a few months, all resemblance had disappeared. He looked at one set of numbers, then back at the other. He might as well have chosen two random weathers out of a hat. His first thought was that another vacuum had gone bad. Suddenly he realized the truth. There'd been no malfunction. The problem lay in the number that he typed. In the computer's memory, six decimal places were stored. A point five oh six one two seven. On the printout, to save space, just three appeared. Point five oh six. Lorentz had entered the shorter, rounded-off number, assuming that the difference, one part in a thousand, was inconsequential. He decided to look more closely at the way two nearly identical runs of weather flowed apart. He copied one of the, the wavy lines of output onto a transparency and laid it over the other to inspect the way it diverged. First, two humps matched detail for detail. Then one line began to lag a hair's breadth behind. By the time the two runs reached the next hump, they were distinctly out of phase. By the third or fourth hump, all similarity had vanished. It was only a wobble from a clumsy computer. Lorenz could have assumed something was wrong with his particular machine or his particular model, probably should have assumed, but for reasons of mathematical intuition that his colleagues would begin to understand only later, Lorenz felt a jolt. Something was philosophically out of joint. The practical import could be staggering. Although his equations were gross parodies of the Earth's weather, he had a faith that they captured the essence of the real atmosphere. That first day, he decided that long-range weather forecasting must be doomed. The 50s and 60s were years of unreal optimism about weather forecasting. Newspapers and magazines were filled with hope for weather science, not just for prediction, 
but for modification and control. Two technologies were maturing together. The digital computer and the space satellite. An international program was being prepared to take advantage of them. The Global Atmosphere Research Program. There was an ideal that human society would free itself from weather's turmoil and become its master instead of its victim. Geodesic domes would cover cornfields, airplanes would seed the clouds, scientists would learn how to make rain and how to stop it. The intellectual father of this popular notion was John van Neumann, who built his first computer with the precise intention, among other things, of controlling the weather. He surrounded himself with meteorologists and gave breathtaking talks about his plans to the general physics community. He had a specific mathematical reason for his optimism. He recognized that a complicated dynamical system could have points of instability, critical points where a small push can have a large consequence as with a ball balanced at the top of a hill. With the computer up and running, Van Neumann imagined that scientists would calculate the equations of fluid motion for the next few days. Then a central committee of meteorologists would send up airplanes to lay down smoke screens or seed clouds to push the weather into the desired mode. But Van Neumann had overlooked the possibility of chaos with instability at every point. By the 1980s, a vast and expensive bureaucracy devoted itself to carrying out von Neumann's mission, or at least the prediction part of it. America's premier forecasters operated out of an unadorned cube of a building in suburban Maryland, near the Washington Beltway, with a spy's nest of radar and radio antennas on the roof. Their supercomputer ran a model that resembled Lawrence's only in its fundamental spirit, where the Royal MacB could carry out 60 multiplications each second, the speed of a control data Cyber 205, was measured in megaflops, millions of floating point operations per second. Where Lorenz had been happy with 12 equations, the modern global model calculated systems of 500,000 equations. The model understood the way moisture moved heat in and out of the air when it condensed and evaporated. The digital winds were shaped by digital mountain ranges. Data poured in hourly from every nation on the globe, from airplanes, satellites and ships. The National Meteorological Center produced the world's second best forecasts. The best came out of Reading, England, a small college town about an hour's drive from London. The European Center for Medium-Range Weather Forecasts occupied a modest tree-shaded building. It was built in the heyday of the all-European common market spirit, when most of the nations of Western Europe decided to pool their talent and resources in the cause of weather prediction. The Europeans attributed their success to their young rotating staff, no civil service, and their Cray supercomputer, which always seemed to be one model ahead of the American counterpart. Weather forecasting was the beginning, but hardly the end of the business of using computers to model complex systems. The same techniques served many kinds of physical scientists and social scientists hoping to make predictions about everything from the small-scale fluid flows that concerned propeller designers to the vast financial flows that concerned economists. Indeed, by the 70s and 80s, economic forecasting by computer bore a real resemblance to global weather forecasting. The models were churned through complicated, somewhat arbitrary webs of equations meant to turn measurements of initial conditions, atmospheric pressure or money supply, into a simulation of future trends. The programmers hoped the results were not too grossly distorted by the many unavoidable simplifying assumptions. If a model did anything too obviously bizarre, flooded the Sahara or tripled interest rates, the programmers would revise the equations to bring the output back in line with expectation. In practice, econometric models proved dismally blind to what the future would bring, but many people who should have known better acted as though they believed in the results. Forecasters of economic growth or unemployment were put forward with an implied position of two or three decimal places. Governments and financial institutions paid for such predictions and acted on them, perhaps out of necessity or for want of anything better. <laughs>